Welcome to the Well Woman Show, where we interview women executives, leaders, and entrepreneurs. And you're listening to the Well Woman Show, where motivated women achieve fulfillment and well being. You're listening to the Well Woman Show. Take time for myself by coming to things like Well Woman Drinks, to be accepting of myself no matter what. Step away from judgment as much as possible. You're listening to The Well Women Show. Just, you're going to be in for a good ride. I don't regret anything. Everything I've ever done, I've learned from it, one way or another, good or bad. Being a little bit selfish for yourself, you know, put your own oxygen mask on first and then give what's left. I'm a woman. I would prefer to, to tell my own story. My story, though it's very personal, is universal. You're listening to The Well Woman Show. And now your host, Giovanna Rossi. Hi, Giovanna Rossi here, and welcome to another episode of The Well Woman Show, where I interview women leaders, executives, and entrepreneurs about their lives and their road to becoming and being who they are today. Do you ever find yourself overwhelmed with your responsibilities, and it seems like you'll never get it all done? Well, you're not alone. We all need to remember to use our superpowers, the ones we already have but don't use all the time, and take advice and wisdom from one another. Towards the end of the show, in a segment called Superpowers for Success, I ask my guest about her superpowers, and the answers will give you the strength, perspective, and power to keep on being the well woman you are. I'm so happy you're here, so thanks for tuning in. Today's topic is balancing feminine perspectives for better business, and hopefully by the end of the show, you'll be inspired to trust the power of your feminine wisdom, recognize the importance of feminine perspectives in business, and implement some gender balancing policies in your work life. My guest today is Hala Thomas Dotter, Icelandic entrepreneur, co-founder of Otter Capital, and a key founder of Reykjavik University. Hala has worked for companies like M&M, Mars, and Pepsi-Cola, and held the role of managing director and executive board member of the Iceland Chamber of Commerce. Hala was recently a candidate for president of Iceland, of which she was runner-up. She received the Cartier Women's Initiative Award for Outstanding Women Entrepreneurs in Europe, and in March 2011, Newsweek named Hala one of 150 women who shake the world. Today, I speak with Hala about why it's so important to have a balance between the masculine and the feminine in every aspect of our lives, what feminine perspectives are in the workplace, and how you can implement some of these gender balancing practices in your own business and work life. The free giveaway today is Hala's article called Lean In But Thrive, in which she comments on both Sheryl Sandberg and Ariana Huffington's major contributions to this dialogue. The awesome team at Well Woman Life has created an annual retreat that serves as a rejuvenating and empowering place to revisit your inner power and connect with other powerful women, all while being pampered by beautiful surroundings and delicious healthy food. It's called the 2016 Well Woman Superpower Retreat, and it will bring together powerful women leaders, executives, and entrepreneurs on October 26th for a full day journey through finding and using your superpowers in your professional life and your personal life. You can find out more at wellwomanlife.com slash events slash retreat. Now to my interview with Hala. I'm sitting here this afternoon with Hala Thomas Daughter. Welcome to the program. Thank you. It's so good to have you. Um, as we heard in the introduction, you have a varied background and um, you're here in Santa Fe. I just actually attended a conference that you spoke at with the Women's International Study Center. Um, Hala, can you start by telling our listeners what you are working on and how it impacts women's lives? Yeah, if I uh, thank you for having me, and and it's been lovely to come here to Santa Fe and New Mexico. It's a beautiful state. So I'm very happy to be here. But I, if I was to pick one title for myself, it probably would be the title of Change Catalyst. But I've been very actively involved um, for quite some time, nearly two decades now, in various initiatives aimed at empowering women and girls. Uh, and I don't do that. Um, um, necessarily uh, from a women's rights standpoint, although I'm fully supportive of that. I really do it because I am absolutely convinced that if we are to build a world that makes sense and is sustainable in economic and social terms, uh, it's going to take more women leaders and more women around the key decision-making tables. Mm. Um, And so that's um, everything I do is in one way or another related to me trying to uh, inspire and empower 
myself and others to take a seat around the table. Okay, and I want to dig into some of that. But first, let me ask you um, how you came to uh, tackle it from that perspective instead of a women's rights perspective. Well, I'm raised uh, in a country where women have had an incredible courage and they have been so important in changing um, my country uh, and its economy and its society. And so just to, if, if it's not too much, I'll, I would love to go back and to share that when I was only seven years old, um, women in Iceland went on a strike. So they did no work that day. Whether they worked at home or held professional jobs, they did not show up. And they marched into the center of Reykjavik, our capital city, and demanded equality. Mm. And that day, nothing worked in Iceland. No banks opened. No schools were able to teach. Nothing worked because when women don't work in a country like ours where the work participation is very high, things don't work. So that was such a powerful day for me to experience as only a seven-year-old. And it also happened to be my mother's birthday. So I'm full and I'm in full support of women fighting for their rights. But what I saw happen and as a consequence of, of this was a stronger economy as well. It's not just about um, equal rights. It really is about empowering all of your people to contribute to the economy and to society. And five years after that day, Iceland was the first country in the world to democratically elect a woman as a president. And that instant in and of itself did a lot for Iceland. Um, a few years later, women in Iceland founded the first all-female political party, and they started to change the face of politics forever, uh, as every other political party started to choose more women onto its rosters. So I really believe that when women are empowered, the economy is empowered, and society is empowered. So to me, it's not just about women's rights. I'm not making little out of that, but it really is about economic development and societal development that's good for women and men. And when women do start participating more in the economy and in, in the workings of the economy, but the society doesn't change mm. to accommodate that in terms of the other roles that women mm. carry, like mm nurturing and caregiving what happened i mean that that doesn't work and that, that's what we're seeing in this country mm. yeah well you are <laughs> i'm sorry to say one of the worst countries in the world to be a woman a professional woman and what i mean of the developed countries uh, because certainly women have worse conditions in, in in the developing countries in many places but so one of the blessings i i'm also thankful for is that i was born in the nordic or the scandinavian region because we have built infrastructure for child care and support for paternity leave, not just maternity leave. Uh, we've built infrastructure and social norms that support a professional uh, woman, that support a gender-balanced society. And you have not done that well with that in America, to, to, to tell you the truth. Mm -hmm. uh, and I have actually worked in corporate America, so I have some experience to speak of, but that was before I had my children. And I'm not sure I would want to work in corporate America again with young children. It's extremely challenging. But at least in Iceland, I'm able to work hard because the infrastructure is there, even if I am a mother. And it's not just the physical infrastructure of preschools and and, and nurseries and things like that. It is also the family and friends infrastructure, the invisible infrastructure of a community or a village that comes together to make this work. And that's at least as important as the physical uh, presence of nurseries and preschools. Yes. And what are some of the policies that are in place that you've seen get get implemented in Iceland that, well, that have contributed to that success? I think one of the greatest steps we've made in sort of more recent times, of course, initially it was to have maternity leave. But when we made the right to a paternity or um, a parental leave equal for women and men in Iceland, that's when we really started to see progress. So if I was an employer and I was hiring a woman or a man at the age of 30, it didn't really make a difference whether I would hire a man or a woman in terms of my risk at losing them to uh, taking to childcare responsibilities for 
periods of time. Because you were going to give both of them time off. Yeah, basically it was three months uh, that the man could uh, take off and three months that the woman could take off and three months that either one could take off, you choose. Mm-hmm. So there are many instances in, in, in the Nordic region where you see men take equal leave as women, even though it is still more common that women take more leave. And I think that's partially normal. It's partly biology, but at least sociology, uh, sociology or the social norms allow for men to take leave and it's not stigmatized. And I think that's been an important step towards a more gender balanced and unequal societies. You know, at the conference in, in uh, Santa Fe that I attended with you, you talked about the difference between biology and gender. And yeah. it, it's so interesting that we still have to break that down, but yeah. it's so true. We have to talk about that because I have been very outspoken for more feminine values in business and finance. And that's been sort of part of what I've been fighting for. And when people start talking about that, very many people want to change that into female values uh, and, and male values. But to me, there is a very big difference between saying women versus men, and there we are talking biology, or feminine versus masculine, and then we're talking socio- sociology or social gender norms. And both men and women have feminine and masculine principles that they can draw upon, and the most effective leaders essentially draw equally from masculine and feminine uh, principles. They, they apply a more androgynous leadership style. And I really believe, after having worked a lot in, in le- different leadership positions, but for a long time from the standpoint of human resources, that men who allow themselves to really tap into feminine principles are very effective leaders. But equally, women need to also be able to pull from their masculine um, principles as well as the feminine principles to be effective. But it's about the balance. And the beauty, in my opinion, is in the balance and the best, most effective boardrooms, management teams, um, societies, they are actually empowering uh, for for both, letting both feminine and masculine principles uh, be there in somewhat equal proportions. Mm-hmm. And the best way to achieve that is a gender balance between men and women, because women more typically bring the feminine principles. But it doesn't mean that we can't bring the masculine and men more typically bring the masculine ones, but they also can't bring the feminine. But when we work together, we're better. It's a sustainable model when we have both. And how do we communicate that and and teach that? Uh, This is a very good question. And I think I still struggle with how how to get that across because I've learned um, that people often get very defensive and may even shut down listening when you say women and men. You know, lots of men never listen after you just say the word women. Uh, That's true. And, And because they feel it's defensive and they start thinking it's a zero sum game. They start thinking that if women gain ground and gain seats in the boardroom or become CEOs or start investing their money with a different philosophy, that somehow something will be taken from them. But so what I try to do, my approach to this is to talk about the economic benefits, because I have found that for many men, that's very important piece to actually be interested in this, that this is not a women's rights issue alone, that this is an economic issue. And it has to do with, do are we interested in economic growth? Mm-hmm. Well, if we are, there are trillions of dollars available by empowering our women. And to me, it's just not smart economics to not be excited about that whether you are a woman or a man. So I start often when I speak to audiences of women uh, or men or both uh, to talk about the economic case, the business case, just so we can all think about it rationally. And then I move into sort of more softer side of things like the fact that we know from research and we all know from experience that when you sit women around the table with the men, they are more likely to bring issues to the table that are of concern to other stakeholders than just the shareholder. Mm. So I've seen this in the boardroom. I've seen this on many management teams. I've seen this in conferences after conferences. Women are more likely to say, so what about the people? What about the community? What about the environment? What about our corporate governance? Those kind of issues are more likely to come into the dialogue when you also have women around the table. And, you know, men typically welcome that dialogue as well when it happens. But it's not necessarily their way to 
um, respect and success for men to start talking about it. Yeah. Uh, so I think they, in a way, also participate in a herd behavior around masculine principles that's, that used to be um, the way to go in business and finance, but in my opinion, have shown its shortcomings uh, and did so in very dramatic in a dramatic way in 2008 when uh, the world collapsed. And again, bringing feminine, it's about bringing feminine principles to the table, not necessarily more biologically, biological women. But, well, but it comes saying. with more women around the table. So I think gender balance or sexual balance, if you will, the balance of the sexes is key to balance of the feminine and the masculine. Mm. I just think this is the way it happens. But it doesn't mean, no, you're absolutely right. You could have a... a um, you could definitely have men who uh, really embrace, and I know many of them, I like to call them enlightened men, <laughs> men who have decided that they don't need to sort of fulfill old fashioned definitions of what it is to be a man. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they're not thinking about to be thinking about being real men, but thinking about being good men. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I have found one way for me, at least to speak to men about this, and I'm increasingly trying to invest my time in talking with men, men who are chairmen mm-hmm. and CEOs of companies and leaders. Um, and whatever aspect they are about this, that I speak to them as fathers. And when I speak to them as fathers, particularly if they reach a certain age and wisdom, they become a lot more interested in having this conversation if they have adult daughters. Mm. I've seen that again and again, because then they kind of feel this on their own skin, what we're talking about. And, you know, whether we like it or not, it is hard for us to have full empathy for things if we don't feel them on our own skin. Yeah. And when their daughters are confronted with challenges or perhaps not as good opportunities or greater challenges because they are women, then these fathers, they start really paying attention. It brings out that empathy yeah. with them. Yeah. Um, so there's this idea in sort of older, old school feminism um, that women could sort of just act like men Mm. and then they would be more successful in the boardroom or in business or as CEOs. And I know you addressed this um, at the conference. Mm. Can you talk about that? Because that is a a definite um, issue that I, uh, that I talk about a lot on the show and with Mm. women Mm. in terms of, um, you know, we don't need to be acting like men. We need to, Mm embrace our power as women mm, i i couldn't agree more and I'm, I'm actually it took me a while to discover this myself when i was initially working in corporate america i was probably what i sometimes now call jokingly men skirt uh, so i was a woman but i learned all of the ways to success from men uh, and i was mostly surrounded by men and i for example learned that if i spoke sports at the beginning of the meeting i got a lot more credibility than if i went straight to the issue and so I learned a lot of things and I'm not saying they were all, you know, bad lessons. They were good, but I definitely have become better and better at what I do the more I am in touch with who I really am. And it's a real loss in the workplace and in the world if women go out there and behave like men, uh, unless it's natural to them and authentic to them, because the very benefit that we bring is the diversity the different approach, the different values, the dialogue that comes when people don't see things the same way. Um, So I think that the strongest message I try to bring across to female audiences is to just help girls and women uh, be unafraid to let their authentic self come through, let their authentic voice be heard, use their authentic values and intuition and and and, and their natural skill set that may be that may come from something else than uh, professional education or experience. It may come from the experience of being a mom, or may come from uh, different places as well. Bring that to the table because that's what we are meant to bring, and together with what's around the table already it will definitely be a richer, better dialogue and better decision. What about when structural sexism or internalized sexism becomes a barrier to achieving that? Yeah, and I think this is this is just a fact that we're facing. And sometimes we like to say that there is there are no gender issues anymore, that we all have equal opportunities, that we all stand on a level playing field. But it's not that way. And, it's, um, and many women 
actually say, well, I know there are some people who have met conscious or unconscious bias, but I have not. Many successful women will say this. And the reason they say it is it's not a popular thing to raise your hand and say, I'm a woman and I don't think I have the same opportunities or have the same opportunities to be heard or I'm listened to in the same way. Or it's, it's hard to talk about these things. But the only way we will ever deal with unconscious bias, whether it's discrimination against people of different ethnic backgrounds or genders or age or whatever, it, religion or, or, or whatever it is, is by talking about it. We have to be able to talk about it. So I'm very adamant about just talking about the fact that we are all subject to both conscious and unconscious bias. And the unconscious bias is the hard one to deal with. And women are subject to it too. So in my experience, it's been sometimes at least as hard and unfortunately sometimes harder um, to talk to powerful women about what I talk about because um, we don't want to admit that we also participate in judging women's appearance harder uh, in feeling like a woman who puts her profession um, center in her life might not be a good mother. And so judgment is not just men against women. It's this, it's sort of the whole system That's is to say, yes, structural. Yeah. it is. It's very systemic and it's very powerful and it's in TV and it's in the media everywhere. And, and it's in all of our, so we have to have this conversation if we want to change it. And, I find that when we talk as mothers and fathers, it sometimes becomes easier because all of us want our children to have equal opportunities, don't we? Um, and uh, we, we, we don't sit around at home and look at our children and think that our sons are more valuable than our daughters. Yeah. But somehow the social norms in the world do. And they, pay, they pay, girls, they, they yeah. pay girls less, mm -hmm. about a month, a year approximately in most cultures. Uh, so, you know, one idea I've sometimes had um, based on the women's strike in Iceland, maybe women should just get an extra month off a year <laughs> until we earn the same pay. Mm -hmm. um, a radical thought. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, Hala, I want you to talk a little bit about Sisters Capital and mm -hmm. what you do in your business and mm -hmm. as, entre as an entrepreneur, because I think that would be really fascinating for our listeners to know about. Yeah, and just to be clear, uh, I, in order to run for the office of president in Iceland, I sort of left my investment business behind. So I've not been active in that, but I can speak to what I've been doing in the world of investments. And so the first company I founded in Iceland was um, doing wealth management, private equity and, and corporate finance, not investment activities, not very typically um, uh Well, there are not a lot of women in yeah. those fields. That's just a fact. And we did found the company because we wanted to do finance differently. And we founded the company at the height of the financial bubble in Iceland in the year 2007. So at the time, there were plenty of banks and financial services companies in Iceland, but they were all on the what I would call participating in, in a very masculine model, a majority men and not just men but alpha males sort of chasing economic profit like it was religion mm -hmm. and the relentless pursuit of profits and in in our view with a very short mindset or short-term mindset with excessive risk with very big egos Uh, and compensation and bonus packages that fed those egos even further. So all of this did not make sense to us who founded the company. We thought there it has to be a different way to make money and it has to be a more meaningful way. Mm -hmm. And you can't care just about economic profit. You have to care about the impact on people and planet as well. That's a more sustainable form of of, of making profit. And it was that was our view that one would have to start thinking differently about it because clearly we have challenges in this world to the model we've been living by. So we decided, for example, to found an, a private equity fund that would invest with a gender lens because our belief was when women are present in the governance structure of a company, the company is more likely to be responsible for more than economic profit. 
so we had a private equity fund that invested in companies that either had uh, women as owners or managers or leaders or had, uh, we found that that population was not large enough. So we also really looked at companies that were catering to the female a client or customer. Uh, and we everywhere we went, we tried to, of course, we were after economic profit. I mean, that's after all what financial services companies do. But we started to set um, mission or, you know, have missions in uh, or impact on what I call ESG, environment, social and governance governance principles. So we were probably the first uh, private equity fund in, <laughs> to, to do so, to start investing with um, a sort of a broader definition of success. So this is just one example of how uh, we've been trying to redefine the bottom line to include not just profit, but also people and the planet. And so you would look for companies that were implementing this ESG, the environment? Most of the time, to be honest, we had to be the active new owner to 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 get that work going. Mm. But we did find companies that had social missions as part of their mission, for example, healthy food company or a company that was trying to uh, do more recycling or, you know, so there would be some, some of the things we wanted to see would be there. But most of the time, actually, part of my work was to be the change catalyst that would come in as a board director, as an active owner, uh, on behalf of us as an investor to start implementing change processes towards that kind of a vision. To guide them that way. Yes. And so ESG is environment... Social and governance. Okay. So uh, if just the environment can, of course, that's the easy one perhaps to understand. But social has to do with no company exists without its community and without its people. And yet uh, definitions have typically only included shareholder as an important stakeholder. But there are other stakeholders that really matter. So under social, uh, we measured a variety of things, but it could be from you know, our HR policies and how well we did for the people of the company to how much we're giving back or how we're working with the community that we live within. Um, a food company, how much we care about the health of the community, for example. And governance, of course, includes lots of uh, governance issues, but gender was key to us under governance. You know, what the gender balance of these companies and their boards were. Okay, so the governance of the company yes. and looking at gender. Yeah. Um, and how do, does ESG, environment, social, and, and governance, compare to like the triple P or the triple bottom? Well, know, bottom I think it's idea? all, in my opinion, it's all different ways to talk about the same thing. And it's about thinking about the bottom line beyond the numbers. And I think our whole idea to begin with was not necessarily to try to be perfect, but to try to introduce the idea of having objectives and measurements beyond the financial ones. Right. Because the f world of finance is so focused on numbers in Excel alone. But when you look at the numbers, mm. it actually works out better for you if you are implementing these There's ESG or the absolutely other. no question. Research supports that very well. But uh, research is still fairly scant yeah. on those issues. But when we started, uh, there was no dialogue in our environment about these issues. So part of our success, if you will, is that we got that dialogue going and there's a lot more dialogue today about these kind of issues in our environment, uh, but still not enough. So Hala, can you give me one specific action item that business owners or entrepreneurs can put in place for each of those, like one environment, one social, one governance, just to, so people could actually get started with something? Absolutely. Well, well, the first advice I would give people is to take a look at B-Lab, which is a very interesting uh, way to measure your own performance on those three measures. So there's a, and, and B-Lab is, for example, Patagonia is a very famous company that is part of B-Lab. And it's kind of a way to self-measure your performance in these areas voluntarily. So so I recommend entrepreneurs to take a look at that because I'm absolutely convinced that both employees, customers and shareholders are increasingly going to be looking for companies that do this. So if you start and it, it's not a huge commitment and not a huge financial contribution, it's relatively inexpensive um, to be part of that and start self-measuring. But I'll give you three things that I would definitely uh, do. And I'll start with the governance one because I care about that. Just start tracking what your gender balance in your company is. Because all the research out there says that you outperform on almost all measures 
if you have greater gender balance rather than less. So start tracking it. Just start saying, you know what, my board composition, my management team composition, the company composition, and even the client composition. Start looking at gender as part of the things that uh, you look at. Uh, and if you do that well, you will attract better employees, uh, more interest from shareholders and customers, because this is becoming very real for everybody. Now, social, that that's so broad and that depends. But I actually believe that every company should have a, some sort of a social purpose. And many do. And we now know from research that the ones that have a strong social mission, like Patagonia is a great example, um, they, they do better. They outperform over time. Tom's Shoes is another one I can mention, just to mention some U.S. examples that people might recognize. So I would say figure out what is the purpose for your organization. If you didn't do it before you founded it, or um, figure it out. Bring your employees together, do a work there, and figure out the social purpose of your mm-hmm. um, organization. And I'll tell you to do that rather than tell you what it should be, because we all know we have enormous problems on uh, in this world. And If your organization is somehow contributing to the solution, has a purpose that's meaningful beyond profits, that that will be uh, a quest that people will want to enjoy us join. Uh, So that's important. And then last but not least on the environmental one, I mean, the first one uh, I would say there is, do you have an environmental policy? I mean, just start there. And it doesn't need, you don't need to solve everything from day one. But if you start by setting a policy and having simple things... Uh, one thing we did at one of our biggest consumer products company was we eliminated waste baskets and created recycling stations. And they served almost like the old water fountains. Mm. People would gather at the recycling stations instead of just throwing things underneath their desk and talk about where does, the, where does my chewing gum go? Uh, where does this go? And people would learn from each other. And then that would transfer back to their homes. Mm. Um, so, I mean, it's, it can be, it doesn't need to be huge for you to start stepping into responsibility. And most companies, to be honest, do a little bit of all of this, but not all companies make it part of their objectives and measurement system. And I think it's a great addition to, a lot more happens when you put the objectives down and when you measure what when you measure it, it happens. Yeah. Okay. How I want to go into some of the more personal aspects of mm. you as a as a leader, as a candidate for president in your country, as an entrepreneur. Um, can you describe a time in your life when you weren't putting yourself first, when you weren't taking care of yourself the way you probably now know you have to in order to do everything you do? Would every day be really politically incorrect? <laughs> um, to be honest, yeah, this is a great question. I mean, I think one of the faults of, of definitely my life and many um, successful uh, women uh, is that we fail to put ourselves first. And I definitely went through, I mean, in my 30s, I had two children, I built a university, I was an entrepreneur, not once, but twice, I was on many boards, life was incredibly, incredibly hectic. So I forgot a lot of uh, things that I needed to do um, during that time, like take care of my health, take care of my spirituality or my mind, um, and things that really, truly matter. So I learned a little bit the hard way. I woke up kind of one day and actually it was around the economic meltdown in Iceland in 2008. uh, And I turned 40 and my father passed away from cancer and my entire country collapsed. And people lost enormous amounts of money and trust, which is probably more valuable than any financial things can ever be. So I, all of a sudden, I kind of realized that um, there are things that are more important uh, than what you do. And, and, and it is who you are and how you feel. And it is your health and your well-being and your relationships to people in your life. And I started a change process. I'll bite slow. I do yoga today. I learn transcendental meditation and, I, and that's been very helpful. And I try to take care of both my physical and mental slash spiritual needs uh, and give myself time um, in order to be able to give back, whether it's to my profession or to my family. Uh, but I think I will speak very openly about the fact that most women have a period in their lives when it's all happening at once where, well, you're a rare human being if you don't 
uh, lose track of those important things for a while when it's all happening in your life. So I don't want to blame women who are not doing it right. Just uh, try to start doing it better. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, that's the thing, right? It's like, how you know, how can we be mindful? Yeah. Of how can we be conscious? I would even say we're so unconscious during that period. Right. Um, and that's that's when you hear people say, "Gosh, time is just flying by," mm-hmm. and that's what's happening. Yes. So how do we slow down and be more conscious? I think. Uh, that's the question, I believe. And I think every person has to find their way to do it. Uh, but I believe in meditation um, and I believe in some sort of spiritual practice. I probably would never have said that when I was in corporate America. Uh, probably not made time for it then either, even if I had known it. Um, but fortunately, we do with time realize the importance of these things. Um, so I would say that's important. But equally important is positive relationships and that's your family that's your friends for me uh, some of my best meditative uh, rejuvenating practices in life is spending time with what I call sisters and sisters can be both women and men but it's people who care about the state of the world um, are willing to engage in meaningful deep conversation about it uh, are non-judgmental and um, help you and themselves constantly learn more and become better versions of themselves. Those are the kind of people that I've tried to deliberately choose to have in my life mm-hmm. and equally deliberately eliminate time with those who are not like that. And so for me, it's that internal practice uh, um, that matters, exercise and surrounding yourself um, with relationships that nurture and grow you and don't deplete you. That's great advice. And um, I just want to take you back to that morning that you woke up, uh, the financial crisis, your dad, you know, all these things going on. Um, And you did make changes, it sounds like, over time. But what did you do immediately in your personal relationships realm? Well, it's, it's one of those things when so much happens in your life at once, I will be very honest with you and tell you I don't, there's there's times during those months that followed the economic collapse that I can't recall. I honestly can't. It was just so much stress that I was fighting on all fronts in my life because my father was uh, basically diagnosed with cancer three weeks after the economic collapse and he died a week later. So that was a very dramatic process. Uh, The fact that I was responsible for, you know, a company with lots of employees, lots of customers with lots of money was a very... A high stress situation with everything having fallen sort of overnight and trust being broken and a lot of anger around. So the one thing that I can tell you I did, I, I did go away um, after a few months of a uh, really tough time. I decided to give myself a week to go away to a yoga retreat and, and be with myself and have some silent time, some reflective time and some rejuvenating time and massages. And I took care of myself. Had I not done that, I don't know where I would would have ended. So I, I, I at least had the wisdom to realize that I needed to do that. And I don't really know where that came from, but I know after that week I got in control. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was a little bit out of control, I would say, until then. I mean, I worked hard. I did a lot of good, but I wasn't very conscious. So from that grew a lot of consciousness. And um, and since then, I'm. it's every day sort of journey. I'm, I'm not perfect. I don't have the right answers for anybody listening. I just have the answers that it's a process. Mm. And if you're not doing that, you're probably in a downward spiral. But if you're in the process of working on it, you're at least uh, you have the opportunity to be in an upward spiral. Okay. And fast forward eight years, you are now you've just completed a campaign for president mm. of your country. Mm. Um, you went from 1% in the polls to almost winning. I mean, being the sec- the runner-up, mm-hmm. being the second person. Uh, how did you handle your, how did you handle that as a, as a woman, as a mother, uh, to take care of yourself during that, what must have been a very hectic 40 days? It was. It was um, incredibly hectic. And uh, I wish I could say to you, that would make me feel very good. I could say to you, I took really good care of my exercise, my meditation, my sleep, my nutrition. Um, The truth is that for 45 days, I fought. 
because I was not going to quit. And the first questions I got from media when I got 1% in the polls and was the only woman really with a fighting chance uh, was, are you going to quit? And I wasn't going to quit. So uh, the fighter came out in me. And I was lucky enough at that time, um, and I have been so many other times, that I married well. I have a great husband. And I'm very lucky with my mom. And my mom is retired. So those two really stepped up and helped a lot, my husband and my mom. And lots of good friends and volunteers helped. So I could not have done any of that if it hadn't been like that because I literally slept three, four hours a night for that during that time did not exercise much, but I did try to take walking meetings whenever I could. Mm. Uh, my meditation practice was not nothing to uh, be proud of, but I did a minute here and a minute there wherever I could. Before every interview, I would do a short, even if I had one minute or two minutes to try to be present. And I tried really hard to focus on one thing. And maybe that's the one thing that I did successfully uh, from the standpoint of taking care of myself is I decided not to listen to all the external advice that I got in all, all the time from people about how I should be or shouldn't be, how I should dress, what I should be, what I should say, what I shouldn't say. And the only thing I focused on was to say what really truly was me and be what really truly was me. So my whole spiritual journey during the presidential campaign was about becoming all of who I am, mm. sincerely who I am and not something that people tell you you should be. Um, and that was very liberating. So it is one of the best journeys I've gone through as a person. I grew enormously and the internal voices that we all suffer from thinking that we're not right in one way or another, and we women suffer from this proportionately, um, they sort of disappeared because I had nothing to lose and I had just decided I'm going to give it all I've got. And that really worked for me. And I went from, um, from a position of impossibility, most people would say, to the position of possibility. Mm. Uh, and uh, I'm proud of that journey. Well, and in order to be able to um, identify and tune in to that intuition and, and act on that, mm. that's that's an amazing thing, right? Because that doesn't always happen. No, and it probably wouldn't have happened if I hadn't been doing a lot more work um, on a personal, spiritual level for years. I mean, I think all the yoga and uh, transcendental meditation prepared lessons have prepared me for that moment. So I'm not going to say that um, that you can find that without having done some work. I really don't think that you can. I found that and I was able to live, you know, but it's also, it's a decision. I made a decision to enjoy the journey and I made a decision to make the journey a positive one. And I made a decision that I would do it so that I could be proud of it. No matter what happened, I wanted to be proud of it. Mm -hmm. And it's a, so you can make that decision, but I will tell you that once I was done, I needed a lot of sleep <laughs> and uh, now I have committed to myself and my family that the latter half of this year, I will take care both of myself and others better than I did during that time. So I don't always think balance comes on a daily basis or a weekly basis or even on a monthly basis for me because I am so passionate about the things that I do. And running for president is not the first time that I've worked like a crazy person to achieve uh, something. Um, but then I have now the wisdom to know that after such periods, you have to have the opposite. Mm -hmm. You have to have rejuvenating periods. You can't burn the candle at both ends uh, year after year after year without paying uh, dearly for it. That's great insight. And we're moving into the final quick segment called superpowers for success. <laughs> and this is our chance for our guests to really share some of the top tips or insights from successful women on the show. And so the first question is just what does success in life mean for you? I think that's absolutely a great question. And I actually say my favorite question is asking people, what is your definition of success? Uh, and it's like with many people who ask the good questions, you don't always have the answer yourself. But for me, it's at least not measured in financial aspects alone. But I did set financial um, measures at a fairly young age that I wanted to reach because I thought having certain financial independence meant freedom to follow the things that turn on the fire in my belly. Mm. So success for me is to be working on something that lights the fire in the belly and helps bring about a world that I can be proud of leaving to my kids and the next generation. 
that's success to me today. But in order to get there, I did have some educational and materialistic goals. Mm. And Hala, when did you know in that quiet sort of internal place in your heart or mind, when did you know that you were really good at what you do? Oof, I don't know if I know still. <laughs> I think most of us women suffer from uh, not thinking we're good enough ever. And I remember when people proposed that I would run for president, and a lot of people did. I thought, oh, God, who am I to run for president? So I don't want people to think that, you know, at least I am not the kind of person who sit around and thinks I'm really good at what I do. I really don't. But I can tell you that there was a day that I... Um, that I um, I don't even know how to describe this, but I got to a point where I didn't care so much what others thought about me and only cared about how I felt about me. Uh, and that, you know, it, it, it was, um, it was when I, my, my daughter was born mm. and, um, uh, See, I had a hard birth with her and she was in intensive care and, and it was not sure that she would be okay. And I made a commitment to myself that the only thing that really matters is if I can do something to create the world that she deserves. Uh, and I already had a son that the two of them deserve. That's really what matters and how I feel about what I'm doing every day to do that and not what others think about me. So it was a life-changing moment for me to to face the fact that I was lucky enough to become a mother. I had a healthy son and I had a daughter that I didn't know if I was going to uh, enjoy life with or if she was going to have the opportunity. So I wanted. So there was a moment that I made the decision not to care so much about what other people think mm-hmm. and really care about how I felt about things and what I felt was important in life. Sometimes it takes those big moments to make. Sometimes it does. Unfortunately, we should be able to be smart enough to come to terms with (laughs) life without them. But we they are there as lessons. Mm -hmm. Um, What superpower did you discover you had only to realize it was there all the time? (laughs) These are challenging questions. Relating to people. Um. I studied human resources as part of my business education because I wanted to be really good at that. But I, that was my natural gift, to work well with people. Mm. And maybe sincerity or authenticity would be the other one. I was like that, but I shut it down. I, I was born very sincere and authentic and open. And then I went to business school and business training and <laughs> corporate America training, and I held some of that back. And then... Since I've been letting it out, and that is also a process, I've become a better version of myself. Love it. Or who I was. <laughs> Always. I love that. Um, what do you do when you get knocked down? How do you, how do you respond? Hmm. Fight. I have a... Um, I sit when, when, like, I was knocked down on the day that I had 1% in the polls because I knew I, you know, I could and should earn more than that but it was the first polls and there were no tv interviews yet so it was um it was a challenging time but i basically i go i'm an extrovert but when i get knocked down i become an introvert for a little bit and that's when i sort of (laughs) re-strategize and i don't do it in a very systematic manner but i really excessively think um and self-criticize enormously Mm. what I'm doing wrong and figuring out. So I really take the mirror and I look at it long and hard and try to figure out how, um, how I can improve. And, and I am an introvert when I do that. I don't speak to a lot of people when I'm doing that initially. Internal process. It's an internal process for me. And then I go when, once I have something and I test on good friends. What advice would you give your 25 or 30 year old self? To not ever let anybody tell you that you're not just right the way you are. To know that you are exactly the way you are uh, for a reason. And those are your gifts and treasure them, work from them and uh, know that you will have weaknesses that you need other people around you to help with. Uh, But don't try to change yourself. Be who you authentically were meant to be. And... um do you identify as a feminist? Yes. No excuses. 
You like the word. I do. It just means that you believe in the equal opportunity and equal rights. And who wouldn't? It's loaded with other meanings, but they are people who have misunderstood the word. Okay. And Hala, what are you reading right now? What's on your nightstand? Actually, Sonia Sotomayor's uh, uh, book is on my nightstand right now. And a book about how to understand dogs. Because I have a one and a half year old puppy and he suffers from separation anxiety after I was on the campaign because he loves me the most in our family. So I'm trying to understand some of his behaviors. Aww. So one biology of a very powerful woman, the first Hispanic uh, Supreme Justice, uh, incredible woman. And I was halfway through her book when I started campaigning and now I'm enjoying the second half and then understanding my dog. That's awesome. I love it. And I have to ask you this because you're from Iceland. I'm sure you, I don't know if you get this all the time, but do you, do you like, do you know Bjork? Yes, I do. And I've done some work <laughs> with her and we all love Bjork. And I actually, we worked with her in my investment firm and I've done some innovation and entrepreneurship work with her. She's an incredible woman. And one of the things she said to me once, and I can, you know, because I, I was struggling in the financial sector, often being the person that I am and the financial sector, not often in line with who I am. And she said to me once, don't ever let anybody take the light away from you. Mm. And that was really good advice from her. And I would say maybe to that 25-year-old, uh, that's what I meant by my advice earlier. Don't let anybody take your light away. Uh, and a lot of people in the world try to take your light away. Just make sure that your light, your authentic light starts shining stronger and stronger as you grow into wisdom and maturity and become the best version of yourself. Love that. Thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure talking to you. It was my pleasure. Thank you for giving me the time. And to all the women and girls and men out there, um, there is a lot better world for us to create. And if we work together, we can. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. That's it for our show today. I've been speaking with Hala thomas Dotter, Icelandic entrepreneur, recent candidate for president of Iceland, and 2011 recipient of Newsweek's 150 Women Who Shake the World. I spoke with Hala about the importance of feminine perspectives in business and politics, why gender diversity is essential for success, and how you can incorporate some of her practices into your work life. You can get her free giveaway at wellwomanlife.com slash 031 show. Our monthly live event, Well Woman Drinks, brings together women to share our successes and challenges as leaders, moms, aunts, sisters, and all the other roles we carry. If you'd like to attend a Well Woman Drinks near you, or if there isn't one in your city yet and you'd like to start one, email me at info at wellwomanlife.com. If you enjoyed the show, please take a moment and subscribe in iTunes. And while you're there, leave a review. This helps raise visibility for the show, which is super helpful when it comes to producing the show every week for you. You can also continue the conversation in the Well Woman Life community group at facebook.com slash groups slash Well Woman Life community. For feedback, comments, or just to let me know you were listening today, find me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Well Woman Life. I'm Giovanna Rossi for The Well Woman Show. Until next time, have a super powerful week.